Welcome to lesson four of my filmmaking terms and analysis unit. You may be wondering why the lighting has changed so significantly from the other videos, and it's because I'm going to be talking about lighting. My first question for today's lesson is a question that anyone can answer even if you've never studied film. How does the lighting of a location or subject affect mood or emotion. Think of places that you've been outside of your home. How does the lighting of each unique place affect your mood or emotion? Can you think of a place where the lighting is romantic? How about a place where the lighting makes you feel calm and at ease? What about a place where the lighting makes you feel energized or excited? You may think of candlelight. Candlelight definitely sets a certain mood. In some high-end restaurants where people go on dates, you might see candlelight, or the lighting might be set to affect a certain mood. In the middle example, you can see how the direction of lighting can affect mood or emotions. When light comes from below, it affects us mentally because we're used to, as human beings and animals on the planet Earth, we're used to light coming from above, specifically from the sun, and we're used to lights on the ceiling. It's not normal to see lights shining up from below. And that can affect your emotional response when you see lighting from below. It can make you feel uneasy or frightened of the figure being lit. In the example on the right, you can see that light can come from many different directions and it can affect the way that we interpret a subject. Light can also change colors and that can affect your mood. It can also be bright or dim and that can also affect mood and emotion. Why would a filmmaker want to add or change lighting in a scene? Why wouldn't a filmmaker just always use the available light in a location? Can you think of a situation where a filmmaker would want to change the lighting of a location to affect a certain mood or emotion? In fact, it happens all of the time. Most of the lighting that you see in film is chosen. Even sunlight can be manipulated bounced off of surfaces, softened or shaded, molded with objects to cast certain shadows on the subject or reshape the shadows on a subject's face. When you're outdoors, you're making decisions to shoot in the shade or in the direct sunlight. Sometimes the weather can affect the lighting outside and indoors you have much more control over lighting and filmmakers are constantly making choices about lighting, specifically the cinematographers. That's why this lesson is actually partially mise-en-scene because it affects what's in the frame, but it's also cinematography because the cinematographer uses light to capture images. If we didn't have light, a cinematographer would have nothing to capture. The camera uses light to capture images. You can think of a cinematographer with their camera and their lights like a painter with their paints and their paintbrush. Both the lights and the camera are tools of a cinematographer for manipulating and capturing images. But as I said before, light falls into mise-en-scene because lighting affects the image within the frame. What we see up on the stage in a film is affected by lighting. So our next category of filmmaking vocabulary is lighting and color. If you already started the mise-en-scene vocabulary, you'll find it in the mise-en-scene vocabulary document. First up, we have the idea of contrast. You can see that these three images are photos of the same image, but you can see that they've been manipulated in different ways. The image on the far left is low contrast. The image in the middle is medium contrast, and the image on the far right is high contrast. Contrast is the relative difference between light areas and dark areas in the frame. I can manipulate this image right now to make it low contrast or high contrast. See the difference? When you spot the difference, it makes it easier to identify contrast differences within film. So you need to make sure that you can tell the difference between low contrast and high contrast. In a low contrast image, the light areas will be very similar to the dark areas. They will both level out and become closer to gray. In a high contrast image, the dark areas and the light areas are very different. The light areas will be very light and the dark areas will be very dark, and the difference between the two will be more extreme. Again, this crosses over from mise-en-scene into another category. Specifically, it crosses over into editing. In editing, you can change contrast. Most editing programs have a category called contrast, and you probably have it on your phone if you look for it. Contrast can be manipulated to change the difference between light and dark areas to make it less or more extreme. 
Here are some examples of high contrast images. These images contain areas that are both very bright and other areas that are very dark. You'll notice that there are well-defined edges between the light and dark areas. That is an effect of raising the contrast of the image. I said contrast can overlap with editing, but it can also overlap with cinematography, since the cinematographer is in charge of placing the lights in the scene. A cinematographer can choose to use less lighting to create a higher contrast image, with more dark spots within the frame and pockets of bright spots from the limited lights. Here we can see two examples of low contrast images. Low contrast images have little to no highlights, that is, little pockets of bright light, and they have little to no shadows, that is, most of the dark areas are closer to gray. The majority of a low contrast image is made up of mid-tones, tones that are closer to gray. And I chose black and white images to demonstrate contrast, but the concept of contrast applies to color images as well. We're still comparing the darkest areas of the image to the brightest areas of the image. The closer they are, the lower the contrast. The more extremely different they are, the higher the contrast. In a low contrast image, that variation is very minimal. There is not much variation between one shade of darkness and another shade of light. Next up we have a concept called three-point lighting, and I'm about to go into an explanation specifically around setting up a three-point lighting setup, but let's define it. Three-point lighting is the most common lighting setup. In this example, starting in the top left, we see one light, and then in the top right, a different light, and then in the bottom left, a different light. When you combine them all, you get the bottom right example, where all three lights are on at the same time. In the diagram, you can see that the light in the back can be angled, and the two lights in the front are both angled in towards the subject, with the camera in between them. You can vary the distance of the lights, and you can even redirect the lights to bounce off of a surface onto your subject. But the concept of using three main light sources is the most popular lighting setup in cinema. The current lighting setup that you're looking at consists of only three lights. I've turned all of the other lights in my house off, and there are only three light bulbs currently doing any work. This is what's called three-point lighting. We have one light that is most intense, and you can see that it's coming from this direction on my face. This is the brightest side of my face. It's getting the most direct light. We have another light that is less intense, in this case, I'm bouncing it off of a white wall. It's the same kind of light bulb that's in this light, just a normal household light bulb, but this light over here is bouncing off of a white wall, so it's softer and it's further away from me. You'll see the difference when I turn off each light so that you can see how one light is more intense than the other. That light is just for filling in the shadows on the side of my face. I still have shadow, but not as much because of that light to the other side. And then behind me, there's an additional light that's adding an outline of light around the edge of my body. And that helps to separate me from the background. Now, I said these were normal lights. They're not entirely normal. They're set right now, just like your normal household lights, to white light. And they're not any brighter than a normal household light, but I can control them remotely. The first light is the key light. So let's see what that looks like when I turn it off. Again, that's illuminating the brightest side of my face. This is what the three light setup looks like without that main light. So right now I just have the light that was filling in the shadow side of my face and the light behind me. So now we have the bright side of my face. Next, let's turn off the side that illuminates the shadow side of my face and makes it a little bit less shadowy. And now let's see what it looks like when I turn the light behind me on and off. In your three-point lighting setup, the first and main light is the key light. The key light serves as the main light lighting your subject. 
it is the brightest source of light on your subject. In the example you see here, the key light is illuminating about half of the subject's face, leaving the other half in shadow. You can see that the key light is circled in blue. In the diagram, you can tell that the key light is a more direct light. It has no filter or shade in front of it. It is shining directly on the subject. Next up, we have the fill light. This light is usually placed opposite of the key light. So with my key light here, my fill light will come in on this side on the opposite side of my face. In this example, you can see that adding the fill light lifts the shadows on the other side of the subject's face. The other side of his face is not completely dark because of the fill light. However, you don't want the fill light to fill in all of the shadows, just some to raise those shadows up slightly. This cuts down on the shadows. Again, it's placed opposite of the key light. You still want some contrast where one side of the face is lighter than the other, but you don't want complete shadow all of the time. And that's why a fill light can be helpful for raising the shadows on the opposite side of the subject's face. Opposite of the key light, you need the fill light. You can see in this diagram, the fill light is circled and you can tell that it has a shade in front of it. It's not direct light on the subject's face. It has some diffusion, like a lampshade blocking some of the light. In my example here, instead of using diffusion, I've bounced the fill light off of the wall of my apartment. By bouncing the light off of the wall of my apartment, it makes it less direct less intense. You could also use a dimmer switch to lower the intensity of the fill light. The third light in three-point lighting is the backlight. The backlight is also known as the kicker or the rim light. It's what adds that magical edge around an actor's head. If you ever wondered why actors look so different in films than they do in real life, it's because they've got lights following them around everywhere. Backlights are commonly used to separate the subject from the background. The backlight shines on the subject from behind, hitting them on the back, but it doesn't have to be directly behind them. While it could be directly behind them, it's usually angled to the side where the fill light is leaving some shadow. That line around the edge of the subject will contrast with the shadow left by the fill light and will create a pleasant three-dimensional looking contour to the actor's face. Essentially, adding contrast, light, dark, light. You usually want your background to be slightly darker than your subject, and by adding that backlight, they'll pop out even more, separating the subject from the background. Again, in this example, the backlight is behind the subject on the same side of the subject as the fill light. So these three lights in combination will make one side of the face bright, one side of the face semi-bright, and it will light up part of the outline of the body. So you can actually make your actor pop out and be brighter than the surroundings. So again, this three light setup is not normal for everyday life. You need to set these lights up in this way, one behind the actor, one to the side, and one further away, perhaps bouncing off of a surface. And this creates contrast. So if my whole face was the same brightness, it wouldn't look as cinematic. And then the light behind the actor helps to make them pop out from the background. There's a fourth light that you can add um, that is sometimes going to happen automatically, and that's the eye light. So if you see light in my eyeballs, then we're okay. But one thing that I could do, I could add the light from my phone as a fourth light to create eye light. So eye light is just a small pinpoint light from the direction of the camera to add more light to your actor's eyes. I'll go ahead and add this phone to the top of my camera so you can see what that would look like. So now I've added the eye light, my phone with the flashlight turned on to the top of my camera. It's probably adding some light to my face, but it's definitely adding more light to my eyes eyes because I'm looking in the direction of the camera. Normally your actor is not looking in the direction of the camera. So you would just move the eye light to a direction where your actor is looking. And obviously it's not normal for most people to stare straight into a light. So your actors are going to have to get used to it if you want them to have big bright eye lights. So that's a three point lighting setup. And that's what I'm using right here to get this look. But I'm not using fancy equipment. 
and now I'm going to go into a demonstration of how this was achieved. Okay folks, so that you can see that I don't have a fancy lighting setup. You can see that I'm just using Walmart light stands. Here I've just got a normal LED light bulb shining from a Walmart light stand into my face directly as the key light. And then I've got another light that's bouncing off of the wall. It's the same type of LED light bulb in a normal Walmart light stand bouncing off of this white wall and filling in the shadows on my face. And then we've got the light in the back. This is just, again, a normal Walmart light stand without the light lampshade on it. And that's shining behind my head, filling in the light behind me. And then we've got the key light that's filling in the main side of my face. So all three of those lights combined, the shadows being reduced. We could also put a lamp shade over this light and make the light softer, or you can bounce it off of a white surface. Those are two ways to make the light less intense. If you don't have a dimmer switch, you can either move the light further away bounce it off of a surface, or put shade over it, or you could try all three. Uh, just normal lights will do on normal lamps, and you can create three-point lighting without any fancy expensive equipment. So now what you're looking at is an example of high-key lighting. High-key lighting has a strong key light and a strong fill light. So both lights in three-point lighting that are in front of the actor are cranked up to reduce shadows. Again, this is bright lighting with a strong key light and a strong fill light. It illuminates all harsh shadows from the subject and it tends to reduce contrast. This kind of lighting is more common in television sitcoms because it makes it easier to film a television show quickly when you don't have actors moving into shadow and then having to rearrange the lights to accommodate for those shadows. It's easier to just brighten everything up so that you can see everything that you need to see. It also ha adds to the happy mood of most sitcom television shows. It's also a common lighting technique in comedic films, which are complemented by this style of lighting because of the happy mood of a comedic film. So high key Key lighting is going to reduce shadows by intensifying the lights coming from both directions in front of the actors. Again, high key lighting is going to reduce shadows and therefore reduce contrast by increasing the lighting intensity from both directions in front of the actor. You're going to either add more lights or bring the lights closer and increase the brightness to achieve the high key lighting look. Another way you could achieve high key lighting is with the natural light of the sun. By going outside on a bright sunny day, you can create high key lighting, but remember the same conditions must apply. You need to place your actor and your camera in the right position to reduce as much of the shadows on your actor as possible. So you could even find a shady spot that's bright enough to give enough light on your actor where they don't don't have a lot of shadows. Sometimes when you get direct sunlight, you also get dark shadows. So you can't just guarantee that a sunny day will equal high key lighting. Next up, we have low key lighting. This is an example of low key lighting. Low key lighting is more dramatic because the key light has been reduced to add a dark shadow. Instead of having a strong, powerful key light, you have a weak key light. This creates that contrast between a dark side of the face and a lighter side of the face, and it is, in general, a lower, darker style of lighting. This style of lighting generates more contrast because you still have the backlight, the kicker, the rim light, adding that outline to the actor's face. And as you can see in these examples, you can still have some fill light filling in some of the shadows on the actor's face, but they also have strong shadows on half of their face. This lighting style creates a dramatic feeling. You'll see it in dramas. It's going to add a layer of mystery or foreboding drama into the scene through the emotional impact of the lighting. Again, you'll have a high contrast between a dark, shadowy area of your actor's face and a lighter, brighter area of the face that is more of an outline that's filled in a little bit with the fill light. So right now, 
I've turned my key light way down to a very weak setting and moved it further away. My fill light is still relatively strong, filling in the shadows on this side of my face, and my rim light, or the back light behind me, is lighting up an edge that's highly contrasting with the dark side of my face. This is low key lighting because my key light in the three point lighting setup is very low. Next up, we have hard lighting. Hard lighting is focused direct light. And like I mentioned, the sun can create shadows and when it does, they're usually hard light because there's no lampshade in front of the sun unless there's a cloud. Clouds can diffuse the light, causing the hard light to turn into something else. But when there's no cloud in front of the sun, that direct light creates a hard light. Hard lighting is focused direct light, casting harsh, angular shadows. So you can almost see the edges of the shadows on the actors' faces as if they were straight lines. So they are described as hard shadows created by hard light. You could also describe these shadows as having very well-defined edges. As you can see in all of these examples, you could almost trace the edge of the shadow. That's how well-defined the shadow is, and that's created by a harsh, direct light like the one I have up right next to my face, creating this hard light on one side and this hard shadow on the other. Again, this is hard lighting. And here's one way that you could recreate this. Shine a light directly into one side of the actor's face and turn off all of the other lights. And you can create this hard, harsh shadow with a well-defined edge. Next up, we have soft lighting. Soft lighting is spread out and diffused light that creates spread out and diffused shadows or soft shadows. Diffused light is light that is coming through some kind of filter that is going to soften it like a lampshade or if you're talking about the sun, the clouds. So you can create soft light if you use the sun when it's a cloudy day. Or if you have a diffuser, some kind of lampshade type material to hold above the actor or beside the actor to diffuse the sunlight. And if you have lampshades or diffused glass, you can use that to diffuse light. Another way to reduce the intensity of the light is what I'm doing here, bouncing the light off of a white or bright surface to create diffused light as it bounces back and hits the subject. It spreads that light out, making it less direct. The shadows created by soft light are going to wrap around the subject, not being so harsh and well-defined, instead being more gradient or smooth from one shade or tone to the other shade or tone. And here's what my soft lighting example looks like. As you can see, while my face is not all one shade, the light wraps around it in such a way that the shadow is never angular. You can never trace it like a line across my face. This is an example of soft lighting. Next up, we have a term for the situations where you can't change the lighting or you don't want to change the lighting of a location. Let's say you're going out somewhere and you find a shot that you love out in public. You can't really change the lights of a location. You can't change the storefront lighting if you're in front of a store, but that available light is just as valid when you're shooting. You just need to find a clever way to use it. It involves framing, it involves choosing your mise-en-scene, by blocking your actors and changing your frame to show that available light the way that you want to see it. Available light is known as ambient light as well. So sunlight, for example, is an example of available light. It's light that already exists in the setting, in the location that you've chosen. So if you're choosing an outdoor location, sunlight, or any kind of publicly available light, those are examples. It may be natural, such as a sunny or overcast sky, or it could be artificial 
special light that's available to you, such as lights on the ceiling of your location or light fixtures, lamps and things that have already been placed in the location before you got there. Then we have practical light. These are light sources that are within the film itself. They're inside of the frame. So not only do these lights affect how we see the scene, but they are actually in the scene itself. These could be table lamps, such as the lamps behind me that are actually in the frame of the image. It could be a computer screen that's giving off so much light that we actually see light coming from the screen onto the subject. It could be a torch or a candle, headlights of a vehicle, or a neon sign in front of a restaurant or store. Any lights that you want to include in the frame of the image are practical lights. We call them practical lights because they give motivation for adding more lighting. So you might add a practical light to a scene to kind of explain to the audience why light is coming from that direction. Then you can add more lights that are not practical, but included off screen to intensify that practical light. Oftentimes this is done with fire because fire is not usually bright enough to really illuminate your subject for a scene, or maybe it's not safe to actually have fire, but you could have some practical fire that's not as big as maybe an unsafe fire, and then you could add flickering lights off screen, out of the frame, to add that feeling of fire being there, even though the majority of the light is coming from non-practical lights. But the practical light, the fire itself that we see in the frame, is motivating that extra light that we see on the subject. So practical lights might not be the only lights you use, so if you do end up using practical lights and showing them inside of the frame, you can still add more lights outside of the frame to enhance the lighting from the practical lights. Next up, we have color saturation. Similar to contrast, color saturation can be affected in editing. So here you see an extremely high saturation image, and now you see the saturation is being lowered. Let's go back to normal. You can see that I have highly saturated this scene already using red lighting, but I can also move that lighting closer to white, therefore reducing the saturation of the image as you see here. So as you could see, by moving the light closer to white light, away from red light, that also reduced the saturation of the image. But saturation is not just linked to light and editing. It's directly connected to mise-en-scene through costume design and set dressing because the color of your costumes and the color of the set dressing also affects the saturation of the image. You can have very intense colors in your image to increase the saturation of the image, whether it's through costume and set dressing, lighting, or layering. Later, in editing, all three of these methods can intensify the saturation or reduce the saturation of an image. You can imagine a director using dull grays and browns. If your actors are wearing grays, like I'm wearing now, and the setting is a very gray environment, and the lighting is white light, you can create a low saturation image just using the physical properties of the mise-en-scene in combination with the lighting without any editing being involved at all. So the color saturation of the image is how much the image differs from white or black and white. A black and white image has zero color saturation. There's not any color in it at all. But color saturation can be raised or lowered in editing. So we can reduce the saturation to make this a black and white image, or we can increase the saturation to make this image full of intense color. Color saturation is manipulated at every level. It's manipulated at the level of mise-en-scene, at the level of lighting, and at the level of editing. These are examples of high saturation images. High saturation describes intense, pure, rich colors inside of the film's image. These are examples of low saturation images in film. A low saturation image doesn't have to be dark. It just has to lack color. So again, 
The closer you get to black and white, the lower the saturation. As you can see, in these film images, these films are nearly black and white. The technique being used in editing assists in this, but the directors are intentionally choosing costumes and set dressing that are low in saturation, leaning towards cooler colors like greens and blues, and then reducing the saturation in the editing to nearly make the image black and white. As you can see, a low saturation image may give the feeling of distress, despair, a lack of hope. All of these elements, again, lighting and color can affect mood. And that brings us to the topic of color scheme. Color scheme, like color saturation, is affected by costumes, set dressing, location, lighting, and editing. All of these things factor into the final film image and what colors are seen in that image. So it's best to plan out a film and its color scheme from the start because most of your crew's decisions when making a film will affect the color scheme. What costumes will the actors be wearing? What locations will we be using? What set dressing will we put up in that location? How will we light the scene? And how will it be edited? All of these are going to factor in to what colors are within the final images of the film. Color scheme is also known as color palette, like a painter's palette with all of the different colors available to that painter. A color scheme is the choice of colors when designing a film. Again, there are so many factors that it's important to plan out your color scheme before you start filming your project. Color schemes can be designed for specific films, specific scenes, or even specific shots. Color choices are used to stylize, set tone, convey a mood, represent traits, draw focus, and much more. So let's break that list down. Stylize. You can stylize your film to give it a unique look, something that's not natural and is unique to your film. Color can also set a mood. It's a somber, negative tone, or a bright, positive tone that can be affected by the color choices for your color scheme, otherwise known as a color palette. Colors can represent character traits. You might have one character who always appears in yellow and a different character who always appears in gray, and that might affect our interpretation of those characters, and it might reflect their personality traits. Colors can also draw focus. If you have a scene that doesn't have a lot of color, and then a character in a bright primary color, that character is going to pop and stand out to the audience, drawing our attention to that character, or to any props or objects that stand out. When planning out your color scheme for a film, you may want to look at color theory. Color theory is a collection of guidelines that artists and designers use to create appealing color schemes. As you can see, according to color theory, one color scheme you might choose is the monochromatic color scheme, where you focus on only one color on the color wheel. Another color scheme that you might use, based on color theory, is an analogous color scheme, where you choose nearby colors on the color wheel. As you can see, I'm using shades of pink, shades of purple, and shades of deep blue. This would be an analogous color scheme. Now I'm using shades of blue and shades of orange. They're on opposite sides of the color wheel. According to color theory, this color scheme would be called complementary. So opposite sides of the color wheel create complementary colors, and in a complementary color scheme, you would choose two colors to focus on on opposite sides of the color wheel. Now I have a color scheme that focuses on three colors, and they create kind of a triangle on the color wheel, not quite in opposite directions like complementary. This is a triadic color scheme, again, based on color theory, which is a set of different guidelines created by designers for designers when they are painting, taking photographs, 
designing clothing. These guidelines are followed in all sorts of artistic forms, including filmmaking. And again, we've just looked at four different kinds of appealing color scheme choices that you might go with, and there are multiple variations of each. I just showed you some examples. Finally, we have the concept of color psychology. Color psychology is the concept that colors can elicit emotions from the audience. They can also draw attention, like we mentioned before. They can set tone, they can represent character traits, or show a change or development in the story by changing throughout the film. Color psychology is used in advertising and marketing. It's used in the color choices of your favorite fast food restaurants. Color psychology is all around us, and the concepts involved in color psychology could be applied to your films. You can see in these examples some of the emotions that are associated with different colors. For example, red can be associated with excitement, strength, love, and energy. Green can be associated with nature, healing, freshness, and quality. But green can also be associated with terror, fear, or apprehension. While it's not an exact science, colors can be used in your film to express different emotions depending on how you want to use them. So consider that when choosing your color schemes, which colors you'll associate with different moments in the film and with different characters, because that could affect or impact or even enhance how an audience feels when viewing the actions, situations, or characters in your film. One thing that I almost forgot to mention is you can also add texture to your lighting. So there's a term in theater lighting and in cinematography called a kookaloris and it can be just called a cookie. A cookie is something that's used to cast shadows on your subject by blocking some light and creating texture. So the most basic form of this that we encounter in everyday life is a set of blinds. Sometimes you've seen light shine through the blinds and create lines on a subject. Maybe the light shining through your blinds right now is creating lines on your couch. But you can create your own kookaloris or cookie just using a board and cutting different shapes into that board. For example, I've cut some jagged line shapes into this board. And as you can see, when I move it in front of the light, it adds texture and creates um, a different texture of light by blocking some of it and creating shadows. So you can use your own homemade kookaloris or cookie to add texture to the light that is being cast onto your subject. Just a fun thing that's not in our vocab terms, but is super handy for a low budget filmmaker to know about because it can separate your shot from any other shot by making it look unique and different. You might just have someone hold it in front of the light while you're shooting the shot. Obviously you don't want it to be inside of the frame, but if you want to add texture to your light, a cookie or kookaloris can be easily created to give your light a unique look. So we've come to the end of our list of terms for lighting and color, but that doesn't mean that your experience with lighting and color is over. In fact, it's just begun. So I want you to try out some of the techniques that I mentioned. Specifically, I want you to try out three-point lighting. I want you to find three sources of light in your home that you can use to achieve three-point lighting following the steps and examples that I showed you with three lights. Again, you need one behind your subject and two off to the front sides of your subjects. You want one light to be closer and more intense and one light to be more diffused or bounced or further away or any combination of those things so that you have a bright area, a not so bright area, and a halo effect on your actor. I want you to achieve high key lighting. This might simply mean that you intensify those lights that you're using and add more light to the scene. You can also try to find a location that already has available high key lighting. 
Again, you want your shot to look like a sitcom or a comedy movie where there are very few shadows and everything is bright and cheery. Next up, we have low-key lighting. And again, you can use your three-point lighting setup, just adjusting the different lights. You're going to turn down the lights in the front and leave the light behind the subject so that you have slivers of light and dark shadows. Again, little pieces of light from the backlight or from side lights and dark shadows where the key light should be illuminating the side of the face. Instead, it is turned down, leaving darkness on the actor's face and just little slivers of bright light that contrast with the dark shadows. Next up, we have hard lighting. And if you want to achieve this, you need direct light. The easiest way to do this is to get direct light from one source. You can create hard lighting by using any direct light, including the sun itself, when it's not in the clouds. You want harsh, sharp, jagged shadows that you could almost trace a line through. That's how well-defined the shadows should be on your subject's face. You could use a lamp and bring it close to your subject and make sure there's no other light that's causing the harsh edge of the shadow to be spread out across the actor's face. You want it to be sharp and jagged, like the side lighting example that I showed you earlier. Next, I want you to achieve soft lighting. In your soft lighting example, you should have smooth shadows that go across your subject. Smooth shadows can be created by diffusing light. You can use lampshades or any other method of diffusing light, such as paper or fabrics. Just be careful not to catch anything on fire, if you leave paper taped to a light for too long, it can get really hot. So it's better to use professional light filters or, if you have them around the house, lampshades, which are designed to withstand the heat of a lamp. You can also diffuse light by bouncing it off of light surfaces like a white wall or a white piece of cardboard or really any surface that's white. Bouncing light off of that surface will spread the light, diffusing it, creating space spread out shadows on your subject. You can also capture diffused light by capturing images in the shade of the clouds as the sun's light diffuses through them. The proof is in your images. If your image has soft diffused shadows on your subject, then you've achieved soft lighting. Finally, I want you to try several examples of colored lighting. And I know you're looking at my lighting setup and thinking, oh, well, it's easy for Mr. James to create colored lighting. But I want you to try some creative low-budget solutions to not having fancy lights that can change colors. So let me go ahead and switch all of my lights to white. And I went ahead and switched off all of my lights except for one. This one light here, I can get pretty close to my face and I can also put things in front of it. So if you get creative with household objects, I bet you can find something to diffuse light through. So here's some examples. You can diffuse light through a liquid. Let me find a bottle of cleaner that has color to it. So this is a bottle of yellow household cleaner. I wonder what would happen if I shine light through it. I literally just set the cleaner on top of a chair and then shine the light through it. If you don't have a lot of surfaces that you can use to hold different objects, you could just have someone hold the cleaner in front of a light outside of the frame. You don't wanna see the bottle in the frame, that would kind of ruin the point of being able to come up with a creative solution for filmmaking. But I'll go ahead and show you, it's just right here, creating that yellow light that's shining on my face. Let's see what else we can find. I found this PS4 case that has blue plastic. I wonder if I could shine light through this to create blue light. Sure enough, when I added the blue plastic over the light as a sort of filter, it did help add a blue hue, but it's not really intense enough. So one is not enough. Let's try two PS4 cases. Okay, so adding the second PS4 case did give me a little bit more blue to the shot. And I think once I bring this into my computer, one side of my face will look pretty blue while another side of my face looks pretty yellow. And you can see my little ghetto setup here. It's literally two PS4 cases taped to a light. Maybe you've got some clear colored plastic, uh, like from a folder or something like that. And then I've had better results using liquid. So if you have food coloring, you could make all kinds of light filters just using water, or you could use a bottle of yellow cleaner or blue cleaner to create different colors that away. 
You could even get creative and combine colors to mix and match and create different colors through the various combinations of colors, such as yellow and blue to make green. So here's one example of a super low budget color setup that I was able to achieve using two PS4 cases and a bottle of household cleaner. Let's see what you can do with things around your house to create different lighting setups using various color schemes. And if you do have a light that generates a different color, like red coming from the taillight of a car, for example. If you can find them out in the real world, that's fine too. But I love to see some people getting creative with different types of light filters. Just be careful not to burn down your house. Remember, papers and plastics can burn when they get too hot. One thing to note when you're shooting these type of exercises on your phone is that your phone wants to automatically adjust for whatever the lighting is. Your phone wants to make a dark scene brighter or a bright scene darker. And when you're trying to demonstrate high key lighting or low key lighting or even your color examples, you don't want your phone to try to force the image to look normal. You want your phone to obey you and let you change the image with light instead of automatically changing the image on the phone. The way that you're going to do this is by locking the exposure. On both Androids and iPhones, you can lock the exposure or the AE, the auto exposure, by pressing and holding until you get the message AE lock. So, if you want an image to look brighter than it's appearing, set your lighting to a normal lighting situation and lock exposure. Then add lights or bring lights closer to your subject and you'll notice that it brightens up. That's because you locked exposure at a normal lighting setup. You could even lock exposure at a very dark lighting setup to get a more extreme result. You can also lock exposure at a normal lighting setup and then reduce or remove or move the lights further away. And this will give you a darker result because your phone locked exposure at a normal lighting setup. When you reduce the lighting, your image will get darker without your phone automatically adjusting. Remember, you need to have control over your images and you don't want your phone to automatically change your images or else all of your images for this lighting experiment could be ruined by your phone's automatic settings. Again, if you want a low key lighting setup and your phone wants to force the image to look brighter, you're going to kind of ruin the effect of low key lighting. So make sure that you lock exposure with normal lighting and then adjust the lighting to be low key. You'll see that the result when you lock exposure is much better than if you didn't. So you need to learn these tips and tricks about your smartphone, especially using it in a film class like this one. Hopefully you understand how to lock exposure and you understand why it's important. When you're experimenting, don't forget, lock exposure, then change the lighting. So what emotions do we associate with different color schemes in this image? You can see the black and white versus the high saturation on the far left where two images are compared, one with high saturation and one in black and white. And you can see different monochromatic color schemes, such as the deep red from the image on the far left, the next image with the orange and then yellow, green and then blue, purple and then pink. What emotions do you associate with these different colors? You can tell that each color is used by the director to enhance the mood and emotion of the associated scene to complement the actions and characters in those scenes. How could changing the colors and swapping them change the emotion of the scene? What if the example of Kylo Ren in red was actually in green? Think of how color is used in Star Wars to associate good and evil. Well, that's it for the lesson today. Again, I want you to try out three-point lighting, high-key lighting, low-key lighting, hard lighting, soft lighting, and I want you to try making some different color schemes using colored lighting. I hope you have fun with your experiments, and I'll see you in the next lesson.